Well, good morning. Please open your Bibles, if you have one with you or in front of you, to that same chapter of John that we've been in as a church now for most of the year since the beginning of January, John chapter four. We've been walking through this scene at the well, scene of Samaria, bit by bit. And today we come to those verses that Stephen just read to us, verses 31 through 38. This is a very short conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. He doesn't have much time. Uh, We'll see in just a moment, they're a bit rushed. So it's a very short conversation that Jesus has just after the woman of Samaria has left to run into town to bring her city with her and just before they all arrive. So a short conversation, but a crucial conversation. I'm sure you have examples in your own life of short conversations, maybe just a few sentences that you've had with someone, something that someone said to you that stuck with you your whole life. So we have one of those instances today of a short conversation, short but crucial. So if you've got it open in front of you, John, the author of this book, lets us know that they don't have much time. They're a bit rushed, and we should feel that in the text today as we read it. It should feel like it's, it's rushed, it's, it's frenetic, that feeling you have when you've got to catch a flight. Um, you're running through the airport to, to, to get to the gate in time. We should feel that sense of hurriedness in, in the text this morning. Verse 30 sets it up that way. Uh, the verse immediately preceding this conversation when John says a large number of Samaritans were coming to him. So you could, you could hear him coming, kind of like thunder in the distance coming towards you. And then if you look at verse 39, where we'll be next week, by that point, the Samaritans have arrived. So it's a rushed conversation that we have uh, before us today, a little sideline huddle that Jesus has with his disciples And it's interesting to me that this well that has just been a place of healing and redemption now becomes a place of teaching. Um, Jesus had turned that well into a chapel with that woman, and now with his disciples, Jesus turns it into a, a classroom. He has some lessons here for his disciples, and that's us, for all of us who consider ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. He has some lessons at the well for us. Jesus decides that in the in-between scene here, the Samaritan coming and going, he's gonna teach some gospel lessons. Really, two essential things are communicated from the mouth of Jesus himself and from the heart of Jesus himself. Two things, two words that we can hang on to as we walk through this short conversation. And the first word is certainty. The second word is urgency. So Jesus communicates today and the uh, Classroom at the well, these gospel lessons of certainty and urgency. So in verse 31, uh, the disciples come back into focus. Last week, the camera had shifted off of them for a while, and now the camera's back on the disciples just for a moment. They've come onto the scene. They've seen that Jesus has just done something incredible. He's been talking with a woman, talking with the woman of Samaria, and I love the, the deep insight that the disciples have here, the deep question they ask. That's really profound here in verse 31. Rabbi, eat. (laughs) It's way to ruin the mood, disciples. (laughs) Rabbi, eat. Jesus said to them, verse 32, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So now the disciples take him literally in verse 33. This is a theme throughout John. Uh, The Jewish rulers took him literally about the temple in chapter two. Nicodemus took him literally about going back into his mother's womb a second time in John 3. The woman of Samaria had taken him literally about living water in the beginning of John 4. So now the disciples continue this theme. Verse 33, has anybody snuck Jesus some food? (laughs) We should be comforted by this. It's okay if you don't get it. It's okay if you don't get it. So Jesus loves to do this. He loves to almost intentionally set himself up to knock it out of the park here. He uses a worldly example, an earthly picture of a temple or of new birth or of water or now of food to convey a 
deep spiritual truth. And the deep spiritual truth that Jesus wants to convey here is in order that we don't forget the lessons at the well. He, remember, he's just performed a miracle with this woman. He's changed the woman of Samaria's life. He's delivered her. He's saved her. And so lest we just move on and think, well, Jesus, do you want to have some lunch? He wants us to really get the lessons here. And the first gospel lesson he wants to convey is a lesson of certainty. Certainty, because of this, if you're taking notes, the first lesson is because the work of salvation is fulfilled in Jesus. Certainty because of that. The work of salvation is fulfilled in Jesus. So here's his point here in verse 34. Look at this for a moment. This is the foundation of everything else. Jesus said to them, my food, my food, is to do the will of him, the Father, who sent me, and to accomplish his work. My food is to do the will of the Father who sent me, and to accomplish his work. So this is a lens that we can look forward through and we can also look back through it in retrospect at what just happened in Samaria. Remember this, we, we've seen this. The, the woman of Samaria hadn't changed her own life. Jesus changed her life. He accomplished the miracle. The woman of Samaria hadn't found Jesus. Jesus found her. He accomplished the finding. Jesus is saying he's the central actor here of fulfillment of God's will. So you can't read John or any of the Gospels without seeing clearly the, the centrality and the supremacy of Jesus. He's not just a man. He's not just working miracles. He's not just uttering good teachings that we should maybe note, put in a bookmark if we still use actual physical bookmarks. Jesus is saying that he is the fulfillment of God's will. It's not just something that we say about Jesus. It's something Jesus says about himself. He says it here in response to a literal question about literal food. Jesus says his food isn't something that fulfills him. His food is something that he fulfills. That's the distinction between Jesus and everybody else in the world. For everyone else in the world, what drives them is a food that fulfills them. Not just literal food, but our, our hungers, our, our thirsts, we are all driven by our food, by what fulfills us. The, 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 the miracle of growing in Christ and new birth is that Jesus, by the power of his spirit, reorders those hungers and those thirsts, but we're all driven by food. What fulfills us? Jesus wants to point out to his disciples here before they go any further that he is not driven by what fulfills him. He's driven by what he fulfills. Here at the well, the center of our faith, our miracle-working redeemer, savior, Lord, Jesus, the Christ, the word of God incarnate, the center of our faith is Jesus, and he is not a needy Jesus. The center of our faith is the fulfillment of Jesus. We've seen it in Samaria. He came to that town, to that well, to that woman, to do what verse 34 says, to do his father's will, and as a result, to fulfill her. So notice one last thing about verse 34, this first lesson of certainty. Jesus didn't only say he came to do his father's will, and he didn't leave it there as if he, he did what he could do and now the rest is up to us. Jesus also came to accomplish it. And the word there for accomplish is finish. To absolutely finish it. The word accomplish here in verse 34 means to perfect, to complete, to absolutely finish something. And so he uses it here in John 4, 34, to say what he's going to do, so it hangs over the rest of the book of John, just picture that like as a ball that flies up in the air. 
accomplish from 434. And then he says it again, he grabs it again on the cross. John 19, 30, Jesus says, it is finished. Same word there. Different form of the word, but the very same word. Jesus uses it here to say what he's gonna do. And then from the cross, he says what he's done. It is finished. And this is to give us certainty. Give his disciples here at the well or here at Truro certainty in the truth that salvation is done, accomplished, won forever in Christ. He didn't need food from his disciples. He was saying very kindly, no thank you. He's saying to his disciples, I don't need food from you. You need food from me. And so my food is to fulfill God's will once for all, perfectly, salvation, and that fulfillment becomes your food. That's gospel lesson number one. Jesus teaches us here, this little classroom at the well he has set up. The work of salvation is fulfilled in him. So this certainty, it's our first word, certainty, now leads us in verses 35 through 37 to consider urgency. Now, this is crucial for us to understand. Our urgency about salvation flows from certainty in Christ's finished work of salvation. Certainty is the ground. Our urgency is built upon that ground of, of, of certainty. Urgency flows from certainty. Last evening uh, at our house, Catherine and I had the Canizeros, White Houses, and Shalitas over for dinner. It was great. And um, earlier in the day, yesterday morning, I had seen Catherine make her homemade lasagna. Can I get an amen to that? (laughs) I had certainty that she had accomplished the making of the lasagna. I was in the room, I could smell it, I could see it. I could help her clean up, that's all I can do when she's making lasagna, is help her clean up. I had absolute certainty in the accomplishment of the lasagna, and so all day I was quite urgent to eat the lasagna. My urgency to eat the lasagna was not because I was worried there was no lasagna, or that I had to somehow make the lasagna. The White Houses and Shalitas and Canizeros would have had to go somewhere else if I had had to make the lasagna. My urgency flowed from my certainty, and I, and I knew we had chocolate mousse pie waiting for us in the refrigerator. I had seen it. I had bought it. I had held the boxes. We had two of them, because I wanted seconds. I held the boxes <laughs> in my hands, and there was an urgency in my soul to eat that chocolate mousse pie. Somebody say amen. There was urgency (laughs) flowing from my certainty, and it was delicious certainty, if I may say so myself. So here's the lesson now of urgency that Jesus wants his disciples to get as a result of certainty, and it's this, that the harvest of salvation is now. Starts in verse 35 here, quoting what was probably a well-known proverb of their time. Basically just says that you can sow a seed, then you have to wait four months to reap the harvest. That's how earthly fields, earthly seeds, earthly harvests work. And so we can often, as the disciples demonstrate, think in earthly terms about spiritual things. And Jesus is saying, no, do not think in earthly terms about spiritual things. Don't forget the well. What Jesus showed us at the well with the woman of Samaria. His fields, his seeds, his harvests work on his timeline. It's an urgency in Jesus's voice here. We hear it here in verse 35. Do you not say 
in your proverb. There are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. See that the fields are white for harvest. You know what Jesus is talking about there? White for harvest. Is he just talking about wheat? (laughs) No. Jesus now is speaking literally. He's speaking literally. Remember verse 30. The Samaritans are coming towards them. Remember verse 39. The Samaritans have arrived. Jesus is pointing his disciples here to the crowd of Samaritans running towards them. They're within view. It's the middle of the day, and it's summertime. It's hot. And the Samaritan crowd is almost certainly wearing white. And so Jesus says, look, literally, look. Stop trying to offer me food. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields, those Samaritans are white for harvest. He's saying, they're coming, look, they're ready. Not because of a single thing the disciples had done, but because of what Christ had done, what he had accomplished. Saying, don't look at this through earthly lenses. You don't need to wait four minutes. (laughs) You don't need to wait four hours, four days. The harvest, the day of the harvest is now. I can't tell you how happy it makes me that Jesus was, was using a pun. <laughs> He's in a play on words here. The fields are white for harvest as they're running towards him. Saying they're ready. Disciples, d- disciples, stop. You, you don't need to form a committee. You don't need to form a task force. You don't need to prepare a position papers, a position paper on the pros and cons of, you know, evangelistic outreach to the Samaritan community and whether or not this is the right time or whether or not we have the right strategy, the right personnel in place, the funding, where's the budget? Is our website ready? Is our logo cool enough? What's our hook? Jesus is saying, I'm the hook. Now, he's the one who's accomplished the work of salvation, so he's the one who has the right to say when the day of salvation is. He's saying now, already. Verse 36, notice that word, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. He's blurring the lines here between sower and reaper and when you're going to sow and when you're going to reap and when things happen and who does what and how it happens and when you see it. He's blurring the lines. Here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. So a lesson from the well is be encouraged. (laughs) They hadn't lifted a finger. A seed had been sown that seed took root in that dear woman at the well. Fruit sprang up in that woman's heart. She left her water jar. And now what do you know? That fruitful harvest herself is now running into town, spreading seed of her own. And now the seed that the woman is dropping is taking root. And now there's a bunch of white clad, looks like the acolytes or the Samaritans. Y'all are the Samaritans over there. <laughs> are, are running towards Jesus. <laughs> Because salvation is fulfilled in Jesus, he tells his disciples, look up. Look up with urgency. Lift up your eyes and look down 123 and see George Mason University and see that the fields are green and yellow for harvest. (laughs) Look down Fairfax Boulevard and see Fairfax High School and know that the fields are blue and gray for harvest. Look all around you at Fairfax County. 
all the houses and townhouses and apartments popping up and know that the, the fields are red colonial brick for the harvest. <laughs> Look across the street from Truro, the fencing that's up. They're gonna knock that old kebab restaurant down, finally, praise God, they're gonna knock that old bank down. Six story tall buildings gonna go there, retail, restaurants, offices, two, three bedroom townhouses are gonna go there. Jesus is saying to us, lift up your eyes and see. The fields are $1.5 million way overpriced townhouses for harvest. <laughs> Look at your neighbors, the ones you think are so far from God. Look at your coworkers. Look at the classmate next to you who seems so hostile to anything you stand for. Look at your family and wake up, Jesus is saying, be urgent. The day of salvation is now. The fields are white for harvest. God, help us. Help us. Help this church never be content with the harvest of the past. I mean, praise God for it. I do praise God for the harvest of the past. But God, give us gospel urgency for the harvest that is to come. Day of salvation, the harvest of salvation is now. That leads us where we'll close, which is with the third gospel lesson at the well. And the third lesson is simply this. Refer to lesson number one. <laughs> the work of salvation is fulfilled in Jesus. Verse 38 is our final reminder before things get crazy, and the Samaritans descend upon them. Jesus says, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored. Ha, others have labored. And you have entered into their labor. Once again, Jesus encourages us. This should make our blood pressure go down. Gives us confidence, not in our work, not in our labor, but in the work and in the labor of others, someone else has made the lasagna. It's in the oven. <laughs> you get to enjoy the delicious benefits of it. So who are the others, real quickly, that Jesus is talking about here, the others that have labored? On one level, he's talking about all the workers who have come before us. Praise God for them. We would not be here without them. We can claim no credit. God raised them up. They dropped some seed. We are the beneficiaries. He's also at this moment talking to his disciples in this context about John the Baptist. All the work that John the Baptist had done, preparing the way. The disciples arrive on the scene and Jesus is saying, be encouraged you enter into the labor of those who have gone before you. But on another level, and on a much greater level, more than anyone else, he's talking about himself. He is, remember, he is the central actor. So Jesus is pointing to himself and to his perfect life, to his atoning death, to his victorious resurrection. This is good news for us, that it's Jesus's life and Jesus's death and Jesus's resurrection that is the perfect seed. And it's Jesus who has won for himself his perfect harvest without us having to lift a finger. Think about this, every other worker on God's field from the plumber to the teacher to the lawyer to the Billy Graham. All of us get it wrong. All of us make mistakes. All of us are weak. All of us shrink back. Jesus never did. Jesus never shrank back. Jesus perfectly labored, perfectly obeyed, and perfectly accomplished the work of the Father even unto death. We enter into his perfect labor and into his great harvest. So stay certain 
and stay urgent. Let these two words from Jesus himself ring in your ears. Let's pray. God, we praise you. We thank you. We glorify you, oh God. All you've done for us. God, you've met us at the well. You sent Jesus after us to redeem us and save us and and win us to yourself. Thank you for accomplishing salvation through your finished work. So Lord God, please give us certainty in Christ. And Lord God, give us the urgency of Christ. We ask this for his glory and in his name. Amen.